Hey there, so let's talk about putting Thompson's plum pudding model to the test. So what this is about, I'm going to talk about the gold foil experiment. And this is a nice story of what science is and should be, which is it's a story of thinking that something is one way, trying to prove it, having your experiment not work out, and then from your failed experiment, and reanalyzing those results to lead you toward the truth of what actually did happen. So what we're looking at is the setup of what happened. I should back up a little bit. Let's look at what's being investigated. So why was Rutherford working with the gold foil experiment? What's going on here? It comes back to the plum pudding model from J.J. Thompson. The plum pudding model refers to an older understanding of what's inside of an atom. I'm trying to pull it up. There we are. Remember that J.J. Thompson discovered that there's negative stuff using his cathode ray tube inside every atom. He reasoned there must be positive stuff also in order to balance it and make it neutral. So he said it's like plum pudding and every atom is a mass of that contains equal amounts of positive and negative charge. So Fine enough, but the thing about science is you can't say something is so until you have evidence to back that up. So that is what Rutherford was aiming to do. He was going to look for evidence to basically prove that this is true. So how do you do something like that when you have something that it's too small to see? No one's ever seen an atom because it's far smaller than any microscope in the world can see. Well, it Effectively, it comes down to what so many scientists have found effective for this. You find a way to smash it with something. When you smash one particle into another, the way they behave can tell you a lot about their properties and how they're put together, and so that's what this is. So in order to find out whether, or to basically prove that an atom is equally distributed, positive, negative charge, spread evenly with no nucleus, he wanted to prove that, um, he decided to use this setup where you have something that produces alpha particles, you can think of shooting the alpha particles toward your target at high speed like little microscopic cannonballs. And this, a very thin gold foil, that was his target. Now, the idea was, if these alpha particles, these positively charged alpha particles, came shooting out and hit the gold foil, he expected it to go straight through in a way like you've got a diagram in one of these slides here. There we are. He expected to see this, where the alpha particles would go through the gold foil and straight through to the other side uninterrupted. Now, why did he think that? Well, first of all, it's really thin gold foil. These alpha particles are like little miniature cannonballs, so think like high-speed um, object passing through a sheet of paper, he was expecting, you know, imagine firing a bullet at a sheet of paper, he was expecting it to just go straight through. And the justification for that, uh, let's see if I can find a good picture, here we go, was here saying that, okay, based on the plum pudding model, the positive charge was to spread out to present any kind of an obstacle to these positive alpha particles just going straight through the middle of the atom. So he expected them to go right through the middle of the atom, undeflected, straight through like a cannonball through a piece of paper. That was the idea. And that is why he expected to see this. The particles go straight through. So on this detecting screen, which if there, it lights up every time one of those particles hits the detecting screen, he was expecting to see them all hit right there. What actually happened was different than that. Okay, this is this diagram is showing, yes, most of those particles did go straight through, but a notable minority did not. They went off to the side a little bit, that's called being deflected, or were, it's called very strongly deflected, aka bounced back. And he said it was like, the way he put it was saying it was as if a cannon shell had bounced off a piece of tissue paper. And think about that. You have the microscopic equivalent of a cannonball shooting at what is effectively like paper. And having a cannonball, having a bullet bounce off a sheet of paper like this would be quite an impressive thing to see. And of course, you have to explain this because if these things are passing through, let me bring this up again, 
If these things are passing through the atoms uninterrupted, this should not be happening. In essence, it was a failed experiment, but it was a wonderful chance to learn why did the experiment not work? What's going on here? He had to explain something or come up with an explanation that would just give a reason why this is happening. So he thought about it. What could cause this to happen? Well, clearly, if a high-speed projectile, you can think of it as a high-speed projectile, is bouncing off of something, it must have a lot of concentrated mass. And most of them were not bouncing off, which means whatever these ones are bouncing off, the great majority must not be striking them. So what could make them, some of them bounce off but most of them pass straight through. He gave that some thought. And his explanation, let's see, where do I have a good picture of it? Here we go, was this. He said, okay, I'm gonna explain that most of them went through by saying that the atom is mostly empty space. So the ones that went through the empty space, part of the atom, didn't deflect. They just went straight through. The ones that hit the teeny tiny nucleus in the center, the nucleus must be positively charged, because these positive alpha particles were not sticking, they were bouncing off instead. So that would explain why a few of them bounced off. And because it's so tiny, he figured just by chance, most of these alpha particles would not hit the nucleus because the nucleus is tiny, and most would go through. That would explain his observations. So another way to look at that is with animation. So let's pull up an animate thing. Let me show you what he was expecting to see first. Okay, this is what he was expecting. If there was no nucleus, there'd be nothing for these alpha particles to bump into. They'd just sail straight through the middle of the atom. Okay, we can even like, get this little option here. I can have it show the traces. It shows the path they take straight through, essentially uninterrupted. But of course, he didn't see that. What he saw was, what he saw was some of the, the um, alpha particles bouncing off. So. That's what I can show you here. Tiny little dots represent the nucleus. Now you with the, you viewing online might have a hard time seeing this. It's a small little thing. So I'll use these little red dots to represent the nucleus. And what's also hard to see is the actual atom itself is represented by these larger circles here. What he deduced was that the atom is composed overwhelmingly of empty space. Most of an atom's volume is nothing. The vast majority of its, density, of its mass is in that tiny little nucleus that occupies only a teeny tiny percent of its volume. It's, imagine a football stadium. If the football stadium is the size of the atom, a properly sized nucleus would be about the size of a fly inside that football stadium. And now imagine that fly weighing almost as much as the entire football stadium. Okay, that's the sort of density we're talking about. Now, let me turn that on here too. I'll turn on the alpha particles thing. You probably can't see too much of what's going on. Let me turn on the little traces option. That'll make it a little easier to see. And perhaps uh, turning down the lights a little bit might help. What we're seeing here is the traces of these particles as they go through and we see that as they collide with these positive nuclei these positive alpha particles are repelled because they're the same charge as the positive nuclei so some of them are just going straight through the center of the atom without hitting anything and it's just a straight path all the way through but the ones that do happen to hit a nucleus are bouncing off like that one or that one right there or that one just bounced back and that would be something that would explain his results. This was his model, his explanation of what could produce the results that he saw. Okay, even today, no one has ever actually seen this happen in terms of looking closely and watching an alpha particle bounce off a nucleus. It's not possible. We infer it from the data that we see. This is still accepted as the best explanation for what could have caused the observations that Rutherford made when bouncing these particles off the gold foil, or well, most of them going through and then a small number of them bouncing off. This exaggerates it a little bit. In reality, only about one in, 
I want to say 1 in 20,000 of the particles actually hit a nucleus and bounced off. The vast majority just went straight through. As a percentage, that's like, what, 99.999%? Just went straight through. Okay, but you can't ignore that 0.001%. Okay, that's how it works in science. You can't ignore evidence. You have to find meaning in it. So this right here would be the reason why, you know, just to repeat once more, Rutherford saw the scattering that he did of all of these alpha particles hitting the atoms. Okay, and so that certainly wasn't the last experiment. There were many more that came afterward because Rutherford knew that there was a positively charged nucleus inside the atom. He didn't know what it was composed of. He didn't know that neutrons exist, for example. But it was a big step toward our modern understanding of the atom. And that is why we spend the time focusing on this.